Okay, guys, we're going to try something a little different today on this episode. This is going to be a solo episode, so no guests today, just me by myself. Um, so I decided to do like a theme for this one. This is going to be, it's going to cover some news topics that came up in November, and I'm basically just going to recap some of these news topics. It's not going to be a bunch, just like a couple, handful that uh, have similarities and uh, share like a commonality. And that commonality is that they're all diseases. They're all kind of like disease related. It's not going to be COVID. So I'm not going to, I'm sure you hear enough about that. It's going to be actually my three favorite diseases. These, this, they're my favorites because they're very interesting. They're very entwined with like nature and animals. Uh, so it's right up my, you know, ballpark of interest. Uh, so these diseases are Lyme, which is like heavily associated with ticks. Chronic wasting disease, or CWD, which is heavily associated with like ungulates like deer and moose and elk. And then there's a toxoplasmosis or just toxo for short. And that's with like domesticated cats. And yeah, so I'm going to get into it. I'm also going to do a bit of a book review. I purchased a new book, so I'll get into that later in the podcast. It's um, it's a book called Bitten, The Secret History of Lyme Disease and Biological Weapons by uh, Chris Newby. And I listened to a few interviews with her as well, and she seems like she's done quite a bit of research and doesn't seem too much like a crackpot and actually seems like pretty well versed so uh i take a bit of credibility with some of her research and the interviews she's done in making that book so i felt like doing a little bit of a review on it on here okay so the news topic that came up in november for lyme was researchers at a uh, yale university had developed a novel mnra vaccine that in guinea pigs offered protection to the bacterium that causes Lyme disease. So this also may help with other um, tick-borne diseases. Um, the way it works is that instead of triggering an immune response, like most vaccines do against like a particular pathogen, it prompts a response in the skin to the components of the tick saliva, reducing the duration of the feeding time that the tick has when it comes in contact with your skin. So I guess it basically activates like a defense mechanism in your skin or some sort of agent that the tick doesn't enjoy and basically compels it off of you. At least this is what the study showed. Um, this was reported on November 17th in the Journal of Science and Translation, tra uh, the Journal of Science and Translational Medicine. Yeah, so we're just gonna take a sip here. Okay. Um, now the interesting thing is with like a Lyme vaccine is that there was one previously, um, marketed in the United States between 1998 and 2002, uh, but it was withdrawn from the market f due to poor sales and basically at how expensive it was and how not a lot of people were using it. Um, which has led to like a bunch of conspiracy theories on Lyme and a bunch of like other stuff that I'm not too well versed in. But if you go looking online for it, I'm sure you'll find a deep dive of interesting information. Um, but yeah, so in case you're not familiar with Lyme disease, um, I mean, it's kind of an ambiguous disease and its symptoms and people kind of experience it differently, but generally... It basically, the symptoms are it gets worse over time. It, uh, you get like a viral response of symptoms, like initially, like kind of like when you're getting like a the flu or something. But over time, you get extreme fatigue. So you're like always tired. You're always sleeping. You're always oversleeping. Massive amount of brain fog. You're always kind of like, you're not sure what's going on with yourself. And then you have a uh, sort of like joint pain, muscle pain your joints can feel like they're locking and stuff like that. It, it can get a, for some people, it's like a, like a severe chronic illness. And 
it can be hard to detect or it can be like very not taken seriously and then treatment uh depending on where you live might be difficult to get in the united states it's a bit easier than canada i know that i've known a few people that have had lyme and uh they struggled really hard with it and actually had to seek care out in the united states for blood work and stuff like that because it got so bad they were willing to pay for it um whereas in canada it's like the free health care but in the states you know you can just pay for it it's quite expensive but i mean if you're really you know on death's doorstep or you just feel like you can't do anything and it's really affecting your life like yeah you're gonna start paying money you're gonna have to do whatever it takes right so yeah that book review bitten the secret history of lyme disease and biological weapons some of this might seem i don't know there was a couple key points in this book and there was some information that was pretty uh interesting and so it might seem a bit over the top and maybe it is i mean these are just her findings i, I can't verify any of this stuff this is all based off of interviews she's done with people one-on-one -on -one. these are also based off some documents that you know that were hard to dig up and stuff like that so i mean maybe once this i think this book's been out for over a year now so if it hasn't gained this much traction maybe it will progressively i don't know maybe once it's covered by more like mainstream podcasts or something like that there'll be more information about it over the internet So the book covers a man by the name of William Bergendorfer or uh, Bergdorfer. We're just going to call him Willie for the rest of this podcast and uh, just to simplify it. But he was born June 27th, 1925 in uh, Switzerland. He discovered the bacterial pathogen that causes Lyme. And then that's uh, hence the name Borrelia burgendorfi. Burgendorfi? Yeah, I think Burgendor. Yeah, I guess that's it. So he has the pathogen basically named after him. So that's what the name would suggest. Um, he had PhDs in zoology, parasitology, and bacteriology. Uh, I guess his life passion was to cure diseases. Obviously, you know, he went to school for this stuff. Seemed like a well intentioned person. But I guess the book kind of follows like that expression that the road is held is paved in good intentions, you know. So in the book, it details how Willie came to the United, to the United States and began work for uh, allegedly Fort Detrick in Maryland, which is an alleged of offensive weapons program or had one back then. And this was uh, like in the 50s, so uh, before the Cold War. And uh, apparently in the 50s, uh, Willie would do some stuff like some initial like experiments for uh, this weapons, offensive weapons program. So he would stuff ticks, fleas, and mosquitoes with germs. And basically through trial and error, he would see what was feasible and what would kind of like stick or be effective with like keeping it inside the, uh, uh, what is that, uh, arachnid or insect. So he would uh, do like initial feasibility tests by using a glass pipe heads and inserting one end into the tick's mouth. And then on the other end, he would pour in diseases. So apparently he attempted this with uh, many different diseases. Um, one of them was rabies, but apparently that wasn't effective. It didn't really stick. It didn't have a good uh, way of working with it. Uh, but apparently he did have some success with some other stuff. So he tried with like stuff with, uh, rabbit fever, uh, Venezuelan equine encephalitis and, uh, various, uh, spirochete diseases. Um, apparently the first initial assignment was putting plague into the, into the guts of fleas and, what they would do to weaponize this was a, what is essentially like a bug bomb was that they would drop it, you know, it would detonate before it hit the ground. And then there, I guess there would be like a cloud of like bugs, like fleas that would rain down upon a certain square footage of area. And the thing is when they filled the fleas guts with 
plague upon release they would essentially vomit up all the plague and then quickly seek a blood meal so if they were dropping this on like a military installment or a base you know these fleas would be vomiting up the plague and then quickly seeking a blood meal which i'm sure would they would still have remnants of the bacteria in their guts as they were feeding and it wasn't like they were you know and they were hungry so they would quickly search out food so anyone stationed on that base or military installment would possibly be getting bit by fleas fairly quickly uh yeah so as it turns out um willie died on november 17th 2014 from parkinson's however it's speculated that it may have actually been lyme because the symptoms can be similar to parkinson's over a long period of time and the reason this is believed is because when he was doing experiments and studying lyme uh he had accidentally previously ac- he had splashed a uh, contaminated rabbit urine onto his face and i guess it got into his eyes and stuff like that so it's quite possible that he actually did suffer from lyme and i guess it's kind of a sad fate for someone who wanted to you know better the world but also inadvertently ended up making some possibly detrimental like bioweapons although i don't really know if they've been effectively used to like an extreme extent so who knows on the actual impact of that but still um so and upon his death he um apparently gave secret notes to a close friend uh before he died that speculated lime didn't actually come from the spirochete but another rickettsia so even though you know he's renowned and famous it's crazy that he's renowned and famous for discovering you know the pathogen responsible for lime from from ticks even on his deathbed he second guessed himself and thought maybe just maybe i should leave this little timbit of information in case someone else can look into it so i don't know maybe to bring that full circle back around is that with the development of vaccines for lyme maybe just maybe these researchers should consider um willie's uh sort of last words before he died not his last words but like i don't know his last worry i suppose one of his last worries for his work yeah so that basically covers the willie stuff and then um there's a part of the book i think that goes into lone star ticks yeah yeah it does so the thing is with lone star ticks they're absolutely fucked they're the most fucked i think I think they're an arachnid they're not an insect because they have eight legs so they're like a spider in a sense part of that arachnid family and they also like to drink blood and stuff like that they need blood meal but they're fucking crazy they're like the craziest insect not insects or arachnid that i don't know they have a they have a crap ton of diseases in their guts that they're responsible for being able to pass to you and they're resilient as hell so their saliva contains a carbohydrate called the short forms alpha gal i'm not sure what the long version of it is but it's basically that that's the abbreviate the abbreviated form and when you get bit by this and you come into contact with this alpha gal your body can develop an allergy to it because your body's developing an antibody to the alpha gal when it enters the bloodstream and the issue with that is red meat also contains alpha gal so now you're not just developing an allergy to the alpha gal from this parasite or from this pathogen but you're del- you're also developing it from when you consume red meat so this will give you an allergy to red meat so you won't be able to eat steak pork um not sure if chicken applies to that but like you know like elk, all that stuff you won't be able to um consume it so for a lot of people that have come into contact especially like hunters and outdoorsmen 
that have come in contact with the Lone Star ticks and been bitten and have like developed a red meat allergy. You can imagine that's quite devastating for someone with that lifestyle. So they're all like, so going back to like the part where I said they're incredibly resilient. So there's been like tests done on these. These things have been kept in for a freezer for up to a year and they've been completely fine. Um, they've been held underwater for 70 days, seven zero and been completely fine. So, I mean, it's almost like a horror movie. Like if you could imagine these things as being like any bigger, like the size of your hand or like a cat or a small dog, it'd be like, like an alien invasion movie, like the tomorrow war or something like you just, you wouldn't even know what to do with these fucking things. Um, Hold on, I need to take a sip of tea here. So, um, Old Dominion University did some tests on these Lone Star ticks. You know, the field of research on these is fairly important, right? Because they seem to be pretty detrimental to our health and the outdoors and stuff like that. So it's good to have sort of like the research and development of ways to cure some of the diseases that they can present to us. So one of these tests was they inserted pregnant ticks with a radioactive solution, which would result in the birthing of permanently radioactive ticks. Um, So ticks have two to 3,000 eggs. uh, And the reason they did this was for the purpose of being able to track the ticks through this study. Um, so what they did was they set up one meter grids in a field and released about a thousand ticks into each of the quadrants of each of the grids. Uh, what they would have to do is they would use a Geiger counter to track how far they would travel over the course of six years. So you can imagine how difficult it is trying to track insects. If you're just like marking them with like, I don't know, like a dye or paint, and then you actually have to like physically look for them. Whereas you could just use like a Geiger counter, like scanner to sort of just like hover over an area to kind of deter easier, easier to find these like small things. Right. Um, so the sort of worry or the panic about this or the fear about it. So like, it sounds scary, like radioactive ticks, right? It's like these things are incredibly, they're full of diseases, incredibly resistant. Now you're making them radioactive. It sounds like like a recipe for disaster. It sounds like the worst like script to a like a action movie or a horror movie. So it, it means basically hundreds of thousands of ticks, radioactive ticks, radioactive lone star ticks were released over the course of six years. And this was located in North Virginia. And the part that bothers people the most about it was that this was on the Atlantic Bird Flyway, which has migratory birds from Canada that go as far south as South America uh, through different parts of the year. Um, so that means these ticks could be easily picked up by the birds or they could latch on the birds and they could be located to further destinations and then perhaps have an impact on the environment there or the ecosystems there. But the even greater speculative worry about all this was uh, mutations of the diseases in the guts of the tick. Because now you're exposing this to, you know, like a radioactive solution. It's like, will that radioactive compound have some sort of effect on the diseases? Will it cause those diseases to mutate? Will they become stronger, untreatable, more deadly? Will you know, there's a lot of, you could, you could go crazy in your mind all day about how, you know, the effects of of what that could be like. And that's the thing what's happening with a lot of people. Right. So that's the fear. Now, hold on a sip of water. So, um, like I said earlier in the book, it's, it was basically apparently that this was done for biohazard weapons or at least to see if it was an effective venture to have in the United States and the book or I'm not sure if this was in the book or maybe it was in the interview with her 
with the author. So there's two operations that were spoken about. One of them was Operation Mongoose. This happened in 1962, and this came from the uh, JFK disclosures and stuff like that from like back in the cold, um, what was that, like the Cold War, or like the Cuban Missile Crisis type stuff. So the idea was that they, I, th- I think they actually did this, or maybe they planned on doing it, not entirely sure, but they had they had the issues with Cuba. The United States had issues with Cuba at the time, and they wanted the people to rise up against the government and to sort of destabilize it so that the states could move in and take over. But part of the problem was that they didn't actually want to kill the people. Uh, I'm not sure if that was because they were kind-hearted or if it was just because they wanted the people were considered labor and the labor was considered important to maintaining the economy once they took back over. So killing off all the labor and all the people apparently isn't effective for a takeover. So what they wanted to do was they wanted to heavily impact the agricultural sector. And by impacting the agricultural sector, that's, you know, the common people's jobs. It's also, you know, the way they make money and the way they can like harvest food. So once people start having a hard time getting food, they might have more problems with the government because it's like, you're just as bad as the previous government. You know, you're not doing anything better. We're still struggling. So what they wanted to do was they wanted to sort of handicap or hamstring that agricultural sector so what they wanted what they did or wanted to do was they dropped the bombs of the um the ticks that would give them i'm not sure what the disease is what they put in the ticks that's not clear but i don't think it was like a super like detrimental one it was just to cause them to be sick for like a chronic sickness for like an extended period of time long and probably for like a few months so that these workers wouldn't be able to work so it would have that like really bad effect on the agricultural sector but once it came time for the states to move in they thought you know they could probably help with treatment with it and they would probably get over it or get over it naturally and then the skilled laborers could go back to work so that there wouldn't be a massive impact on the infrastructure or the economy when the new government or united states wanted to take over it's so diabolic like it's like so like it sounds like a conspiracy theory and i guess in its own right it is but i mean if it actually is like detailed in the jfk disclosure like uh those declassified papers and i guess it actually did happen and it is real but i haven't looked into it myself but uh in an interview with uh that author there uh that's what she's saying so that's crazy to think like this is how like weapon operations work for like the governments and stuff like that they go like very methodic it's not just like okay bomb them wipe them out it's like no we we need something more with like more finesse or like more like nuance that kind of like you know we gotta hamper damper them but not extremely just enough to like so we can take over and then it's still good for us like it's very crazy very interesting though i can't believe like a lot of stuff people like can't believe happens like they just the cognitive dissonance takes over and it's like, I don't want to hear that. I don't want to believe it. Or it's probably just made up. But, um, hold on, I need another sip. So, uh, the big itch was another operation. This one was just sort of to test. So what they did was they painted these big targets on the desert floor in the States. Forget which desert it is, probably Nevada. They would you know, build like these giant targets, like that were about the size of the average, like military installment or airbase. And the purpose of this operation was to determine how many ticks and what size of like tick bombs they would need to like effectively cover an entire square footage of like a military installment. So they detonated these like flea bombs over you know, into the desert and they found out how many like square footage and how many fleas they would need to cover a certain amount of area. Apparently the test was successful. And, uh, the only other thing besides the negative thing, people look at that 
or that the author pointed out about that was that there was nothing done about like exterminating the fleas after they were released. It was just that they were left to roam. So if they were to make their way into like the next, I'm not sure how far into the desert or what the, like how like, how like a sturdy a flea is in the desert and its survivability. But I mean, if they can travel pretty quick or they can like use like the wind, they could probably get into like, you know, like a nearby town or something. Like it just seems like there wasn't a lot of um, conscious thought put into uh, the effects it could have on the uh, local population. And then, uh, yeah, so I don't know. That's, that's about it. That's all like, those are the interesting takeaways I got from like the book. Um, it's a pretty, it's a pretty cool book about Lyme disease and stuff like that. I suggest giving it a read. Uh, what was that book called? It's called Bitten. The History of Lyme Disease and Biological Weapons by uh, Chris Newby. And yeah, I don't know. She seems like a pretty talented la- lady and I I uh, suggest giving it a read. It's a pretty interesting book. Uh, so we're going to move into the next disease topic now and that's going to be Chronic Wasting Disease or CWD or zombie deer disease which is the funner more commonly used term and so the news article that came out in november for cwd was that an endangered deer prion gene could protect it from cwd or could be used to protect other deer from cwd so What you need to know about CWD is that it's very similar to mad cow disease. And uh, what's what's that one? It's like Jacob something disease in people. Um, uh, The symptoms are basically like uh, you can't eat for the deer. I guess it's for like deer and stuff. Uh, They can't eat. They slowly waste away. Um, They lose their fear of humans. Um, It's just like they chronically waste away. And it's just like, I don't know, it's like a brain disease. It's like mad cow in a way. Um, The scary thing about it is that the longevity is unknown, like, and how it spreads. So if it's like on a surface or something, the only similar, so like the similar, like prion disease, like uh, 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 scrappy and sheep. The pry- that prion has been measured to endure for up to 16 years. So that is an incredibly long time for this, like, uh, prion disease to exist just, like, on surfaces. So you can imagine that when a deer with this disease dies out in the wild, its corpse or its guts or its saliva or, like, what bodily fluids are just uh, contaminated with the CWD and wherever that stuff touches the soil the grass whatever it all becomes contaminated with cwd as well so the next deer to come along in that area up to 16 years later possibly if it's similar to scrappy and sheeps which is a very similar like prion disease they could in theory become contaminated too and it could become like i don't know like a very very bad disease that affects all deer Maybe it causes them to go extinct. The big worry about it, though, is that it somehow makes the leap to humans where, you know, we consume contam- like a deer that was contaminated with it or was diseased with it. Or maybe from like farms from people living in close proximity to them regularly, you know, dealing with their like fecal matter or like, uh, you know, dead like the dead deer and stuff like that it just happens to the the disease just makes that transition to people and this would be like an absolutely devastating disease in people right like watching someone chronically waste away with like no real treatment for it and then it how like contagious it can be for up to 16 years like in theory like if that went to any of us it'd be a very like bad disease would be a bad situation it wasn't like and the thing is like 
the CWD protein is insoluble, except in like the strongest of solvents and highly resistant to digestion. So, um, like a little Lysol spray or wipe may not even kill it. You may need to have like it like drenched in like really strong, like pure alcohol substance for like a, like a significant duration to really kill it off. Or like, I don't know, most cases they say to completely incinerate the, uh, they like the the dead deer. That's like the only way to really make sure it's gone for good. Um, yeah, so it's like highly transmissible. Transmissible. You get it directly through contact, but indirect through corpses and like the corpses in the environment, like the contaminated ground. Um, another thing is like crows, maybe even like vultures, like turkey vultures. They could be like a vector, like carrier spreader. And by that, I mean, like, so they consume some of the contaminated meat. And although they may not get sick themselves, um, their guts will, because the CWD protein is, it, it, like, resistant to digestion, it'll continue to exist in the guts of these crows. And then those crows will, you know, defecate. And they'll have fecal matter. And then that, the CWD will continue to exist in that fecal matter. So even though the crow isn't necessarily a carrier, like in that it's sick itself, it's just like a storage unit for it. And it can just kind of like, you know, then it poops on the ground, poops on a leaf, a moose, an elk, a deer come along, they eat that leaf, and then suddenly now they have chronic wasting disease. So when we think of like epidemics and pandemics, I mean, this one sounds terrifying if it ever made a transition to humans um you know prevention obviously like there should be like regular testing maybe even like field testing kits for hunters when they you know when they kill a deer um if you do come across one that's positive to incinerate it maybe even like you know controlled scorching of the earth in that like small vicinity um yeah so but um anyway the news about this last month was that the university of illinois the college of agricultural consumer and environmental sciences apparently came through a study uh there's a there's an endangered species of deer in china called david's deer and in the 1800s it was down to about 18 species uh 18 individuals left it's now recuperated a bit and it's up to 3,000 that's still not a good number it's still very low but what they found was that there was gene variants that occurred naturally in this deer that may protect it from cwd and the reason they think it protects them from cwd is because um this gene variant has been linked to uh, reduce susceptibility in other species. So they think other species other than deer are not as susceptible to CWD because of this gene variant. It may not be because of this gene variant, but it has, it seems to be in a few studies linked to being the reason for this or certain species being more resistant to it or less susceptible to it. However, Obviously, more studies will need to be done if it's actually applicable to deer as well. So there is a there is research being done, and it's not all that scary. And, you know, it, it kind of speaks back to, like, the importance of protecting endangered species because you never know, like, what kind of species could have, like, little things like this, like a little gene variant that happens to make it resistant. So maybe this endangered deer that was once down to only 18 left comes back and it goes to show like huh wow this because we preserved this species we were able to you know save many more species and maybe even go as far to develop inoculation for the species you know where we can start like you know perhaps inoculating wildlife you know, they like to do airdrops for like raccoons and stuff, but they come across and they eat something that helps them. I don't know if it'll ever get that advanced, but 
for CWD, but we can hope. And, you know, and then that will reduce its possibility of once it's because if it's really prevalent in deer and it's like most deer, then the, 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 the likelihood of it being able to jump to humans also increases just because of it's a num- sheer numbers game. But, um, yeah, I don't know. It just feels like this is like a prime example of why conservation is important. Why it's like, oh, who cares? It's just another deer. There's tons of deer. We can just replace it with a different deer, put a new deer in there. It's like, no, well, every little variation is important. It's all about a, like a bigger part of like the food chain, you know, the ecosystem. But like, here's the, here's the other side of it. It's like everything in nature kind of presents possibly like a really key to like science and like human benefits like how many things have been developed from like plants you know and like making like medicine or like chemicals or certain things like that like i don't know i don't have to really preach to the choir about why it's important right you guys already know most that if you're listening to me but uh yeah so that's the end of my cwd rant how long have i been going on for 36 minutes i'm impressed i didn't even think this would go this long but uh yeah i got a little bit left so maybe we'll make it to like 45 minute mark so the stretch goal is an hour but i don't know if it'll be that long so the last one is toxoplasmosis so if you're like me and you got a cute little fur friend that uh runs around your house and claws up your furniture Mine doesn't actually claw my furniture. Mine's pretty good. Claws up your carpet or bothers you and bats you on the head while you're sleeping. Talking about a domestic house cat. Then you probably know about toxic plasmosis. And if you don't, you will now. And maybe you should. So what is toxic plasmosis? It's a, it's a parasitic disease. It, it exists in many cats. I want to say pretty much all of them. I could be wrong about that. Don't quote me. Um, and uh, it's caused by a similarly named uh, bacteria called Toxoplasma gondii, And it is basically distributed through cat feces. So you have a litter box in your house. You've got to clean the litter box. Chances are you're going to come in contact with it. Or it's on the bottom of its paws when it leaves the litter box and scampers throughout your house you know leaving little bits of it around uh the interesting thing about toxic plasmosis is mostly what's been observed and studied through rodents primarily rats so when rats become uh infected with toxo they lose the fear of the uh uh, cat odors like uh it's urine and stuff like that which is very concerning because, or not concerning, but it's very interesting that a rodent that is normally terrified or very fearful or completely avoids areas where there's like feline odors, it now doesn't, it has like, really doesn't care about it anymore. Um, There's also been observed that it's increased the mating behavior of rats. I guess it's like kind of like, essentially made like male rats horny is what they've observed which is interesting because it's like if you want to think about it as like an evolutionary advantage for cats it's like not only does it make it easier to hunt and prey upon rats because now they're not afraid of their urine it also increases the rate at which they want to reproduce creating more of like a food supply and then when they consume the contaminated rat you know or give it to like kittens or like other cats and those cats also become affected and, you know, the the uh, the cycle continues on. Uh, there's some, like, speculative uh, science into what the effects of it on people are. You know, some people try to make a correlation to this is why you have crazy cat ladies. Or, you know, this is, they're trying to say this is responsible for higher risk like adrenaline junkie behavior in humans uh but i mean i'm not sure exactly how reliable those studies are but they just like they would take samples of people who like 
died in like cliff jumping accident skydiving you know like extreme sport type stuff and then most of those people would test like i would say like a staggering amount of people like i want to say high 90s would test positive for toxo so i think like those are the reasons why they think thought that might be the effect it has on people because it does sort of have that effect on rats as well right so the rats become less daring they're more mobile they're not really afraid of cats anymore in a sense where they lose their fear to like the cat odors so maybe there is a bit of a correlation you could make between rodents and people but it's a bit of a jump but i mean it's a starting point right for research but um yeah i don't know it's interesting um so the news article was basically this uh this woman by the name of dr amy wilson who uh research research by university of british columbia suggests that free roaming cats to blame in the spread of toxoparasite to wildlife so this is basically a little message that i believe if you have a domesticated cat you should keep it indoors yeah a lot of cats do like to go outside and they love to you know hunt you know rodents and birds but there's plenty of reasons to keep your cat inside to benefit the environment so many of you may know that you annually house cats domestic house cats that are like outside are responsible for the death of like billions of songbirds like billions literally billions they're having like a horrible impact on you know wildlife in terms of like songbirds you know robins blue jays just like any little finches you see um they love the hunt they're effective hunters they're very cunning they're very like adaptive and they kill them in mass every year like because there's tons of cats in canada and the united states right plenty of people let them outside they breed outside they become like feral populations so on and so forth so these uh having keeping your cat outdoors is incredibly detrimental to the bird populations not only that i mean probably like you know rodent populations as well to a certain degree um but you know here's another example from the study is like now it's also spreading toxo to wildlife and we don't necessarily know what the impacts on other species will be if any there probably will be something but uh it's probably better that we don't kind of like play with this too much right like because you never know what can like sort of evolve or mutate or come to be over time uh so yeah that's basically my uh pr message about keeping your cat inside plus like it's not really actually safe for the cat like they'll come in contact with one of those like crazy lone star ticks maybe maybe they'll come in contact with like just a regular tick like a coyote or like a raccoon they'll get like hurt or injured like even though cats could probably like a well-adapted cat could probably escape a coyote because it could climb a tree or something but then like inclement weather like i don't know these things all seem like sort of cruel right to have your cat have to deal with so like there is kind of like a responsible not being cruel aspect to it there's also sort of like a, a environmental responsibility aspect to it too so it goes both ways I know some people will say like, oh, but they enjoy it so much. They're living like their best life out there. And it's like, okay, but is it a wild animal or is it a domestic animal? And if you're going to let it be wild, then it's then feral. You know, then there's all these like defenseless kittens out there being born and they're dying early. Um, I don't know. There's like a, like, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not for like letting like a domesticated animal outside, just kind of disturbing like the ecosystem um i don't know we have wild species of cat i mean and they're just fine they're doing their part in the uh, ecosystem but yeah so that pretty much wraps up my three favorite diseases and that they're very interesting they have unique histories and i'm sure there's much more information about all of those that i didn't cover but I'm not an epidemiologist or a virologist or anything like that. So take everything I say with a grain of salt, do your own research. I just find this stuff fascinating because it is sort of like, it's not really a part of the animal kingdom, but it is in a way like indirectly, 
you know, the, the, like viruses and pathogens, all these things are still like, you know, life forms, even though we can't see them. They're still sort of like, I don't know, I, 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 I like the microscopic animal kingdom, we'll call it, is also a, just as appealing and interesting to me as the macroscopic or like the real world you know, the charismatic megafauna and all that stuff. So I decided to do like a little dedicated episode to, um, you know, the, the micro world and sort of like its impact on, you know, nature and wildlife and all that stuff. Well, I hope you enjoyed my solo podcast. It's clear at this point I have ran out of people to interview, which isn't true. I still have a few people that want to do it. That's just finding time these days. I mean isn't always easy to line up schedules to everybody so i'm sure we'll see some more people down the road um hopefully the quality of these podcasts improves over time uh you know uh if you want to check me out i'm also on instagram at uh it's at epion explorer so e-p-y-o-n e-x-p-l-o-r-e-s on instagram uh if you want to help support me follow the podcast i'm going to try to expand where this podcast is available but i'll talk about more about that in the future in a podcast anyway thanks for listening cheers